Bezrat Hashem, tonight we're going to say some Divrei Chizuk, the Divrei Torah, Rehui Nishmata, Batsheva, Kanievsky, on her Shloshim, who passed away Shabbat Halamuad Sukkot, Ruach Hashem, and Ahena Began Eden. Our Chachamim tell us that there were only three people who made it into this exclusive club called Avotenu HaKedoshim, our patriarchs, our forefathers. Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov are the only ones who we refer to as Avinu. Abraham Avinu, Yitzchak Avinu, Yaakov Avinu. Yet we find a contradiction. We find that somewhere else our Chachamim tell us that there's one more person who managed to fit himself, to find himself in this club. Our Chachamim tell us that Moshe Rabbeinu is also from Avotenu HaKedoshim. He's also from the patriarchs, from the forefathers. Perhaps we can answer, we can understand this contradiction through a Gemara in Baba Metzi'ah. The Gemara says that a student, a son, he has the obligation to respect his rabbi, the Chacham, more than his father. The Gemara explains that it's his father who brings him into the world, but it's the Chacham, it's the rabbi who teaches him that brings him into Olam Haba. Therefore, it's the rabbi who deserves more respect than the father. Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov are our physical forefathers. Abraham Avinu, Yitzhak Avinu, Yaakov Avinu. But Moshe, he's our spiritual forefather. He's the one who brought the Torah down and taught Kal Yisrael the 613 mitzvot. Therefore, we refer to Moshe not as Moshe Avinu, but we give him a loftier title, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, our master and teacher. He's more than just an Av. He's more than just Avinu. He's Moshe Rabbeinu. In a similar vein, Sarah, Rivka, Rahel, Vele'ah, they are the physical mothers. They are the Imahot of Klal Yisrael. But Miriam, she's also included in the select group. She also made it as an imam, as part of the imahot. When Paro decreed that all the boys should be thrown in denial, Amram divorced his wife, Yochevet. It was Miriam who rebuked her father. You're worse than Paro, she told him. Paro decreed on the males. But by separating from our mother, you decreed on the males and the females. When Moshe Rabbeinu was floating aimlessly down the Nile, it was Miriam who was watching over him. When Bnei Israel left Egypt and the women were confused about their role, how do they fit into this nation called Klal Israel? The Pasuk says, Vata'an lahem Miriam. It was Miriam who guided them. It was Miriam who instructed them. You see that Miriam they literally, they conceived B'nai Israel. They gave birth to B'nai Israel. But Miriam, like her brother Moshe, she's the spiritual mother. She occupies a special place. The Hatam Sofer goes as far to say that in this star-studded family of Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam, they were all siblings. But Miriam, she was the star of the show. She was the sibling that stood out. She was greater than Moshe and Aharon. In every generation, the Nashim Tzadkaniyot, the righteous women, they are the successors to Miriam HaNevi'ah. Every generation has its imahot, has its spiritual mothers. In the same way that it was Miriam who encouraged her father to remarry their mother, it was Miriam who watched over Moshe Rabenu. It was Miriam who instructed the women. It's the Nashim Satkaniyot in every generation that provide the guidance and encouragement. 
On Shabbat Cholamot Sukkot, we lost one of these Limaot. We lost one of these successors to Miriam Hanevi'ah. On Shabbat Cholamot Sukkot, Rabbani Pacheva Kanievsky, the wife of the Gaon Harabhaim Kanievsky, and the daughter of Rav Yosef Shalom El Yashiv, that he should live and be well. He's still alive at the age of 101. She returned her pure neshama to the Bore Olam. The Gemara tells us that before the greatness of Abraham and Sarah were known to the world, it was restricted to their immediate surroundings. Abraham was known as Abram, the father of a nation called Aram. Sarah was known as Sarai. Sarai means nobility. She was the noble woman of the nation of the nation of Aram. But when their greatness spread, Abram became Abraham, the father of the entire world. And Sarai became Sarah. She now became the noble woman of the world. Her nobility and influence spread throughout the entire world. In a similar vein, we can say that Rabbanit Kanievsky, her nobility, her influence, it knew no bounds. Sephardim, Ashkenazim, Hasidim, the observant, the traditional, the secular, she managed to touch everybody. We can perhaps draw a parallel from Deborah HaNevi'ah. The Gemara tells us that in the time of Deborah HaNevi'ah, Bnei Yisrael had reached heights. They had reached a connection with the Bore Olam that no other generation had. Not the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu, not the generation of Shmuel Anavi, of David HaMelech, of Shlomo HaMelech. It was under the influence under the guise of Devorah HaNevi'ah that Bnei Israel had reached unparalleled heights. So Svot asks that Devorah HaNevi'ah, as we know, she lived in the time of the Shoftim. She led Bnei Israel in the time of the judges. So Svot asks simply, we know that a woman, she's not allowed to sit on a Bedin. She's not allowed to judge. She can't be a Dayan. How could Deborah HaNevi'ah have led Bnei Israel in the time of the Shoftim of the judges? She wasn't allowed to judge the nation. The Sfot answers, she didn't judge the nation. She taught the people. She taught the men how to judge the nation. She taught them the moral statutes that they needed to know in order to lead the people. In the same way, that a Jewish mother teaches the moral statutes to her family to live by, Devorah HaNevi'ah, she took it on a much greater scale. She took it on a national level. She taught the nation how to live. The men judged, but they learned from her. In Bereshit, we describe a woman as Azad Kenegdo, a helper against him. The Mephashim ask, the Mephashim struggle. What does it mean, Ezeb Kenegdo? A helper against them. They struggle to understand what does this phrase mean? And the Chachamim explain, Ezeb Kenegdo. She's a helper, she stands by her husband against all the negative influences. Because this is the role of the Jewish woman. She is given this God given talent this supernatural power to protect her husband, to protect the men from all the negative influences around her. That's why it comes as no surprise that it was Sarah who picked up on Ishmael, on his evil character, not Abraham. It comes as no surprise that it was Rivka who saw through Isaac as opposed to Yitzchak. It comes as no surprise that it was Miriam who rebuked her father and not Aharon. It was the wife of On ben Pelet who stopped them from, from, from gathering together with Korach. It was Deborah HaNevi'ah that Klal Israel had reached unparalleled heights, not under Moshe, not under Shmuel, not under David or Shlomo, but under a woman because it's her God-given role. It's her 
God-given talent that she can protect the people. She can protect – the women can protect their husbands from the evil influences. A housewife in Hebrew is called an akedet bayit, a pillar, the foundation of the home. Just as Devorah HaNevi'ah was a pillar, she was the foundation in her time. Rabbanit Kanievsky, she was one of the pillars. She was one of the foundations of Kal Yisrael in our times. The story is told that a young woman by the name of Riva came to the Rabbanit for a bracha. She was about to get married, and she asked her for a bracha. And the Rabbanit began to inquire about her future husband. And this Riva revealed to her that she's engaged to be married to an Arab, and she's looking for a bracha. The Rabbanit began to try to convince her to drop the marriage. What are you doing? It's not for a Bat Yisrael. But nothing she said to her would help. This lady was said that she was going to marry this Arab. Finally, the Rabbanit in tears, she said to her, do me a favor. If you're not going to listen to me, if you're not going to break off this marriage, Rabbanit Kanievsky said to her, promise me that you'll say one perek tehilim a day. So this Riva, and you're going to see in a moment why it's important that we know her name is Riva, she said, okay, I'm going to go through with the marriage, but I promise you I'll say one perek of tehilim a day. A week later, Riva came back to the Rabbanit, and she told her, I broke off the marriage. I canceled the wedding. I dumped my boyfriend. And the Rabbanit was shocked. She said, you were so set on marrying this Arab. What happened? Well, she said, I followed your advice. After seeing you, I got home, and I opened the Tehillim. And it just so happened that my eyes fell on the Pasuk, Shofteni Elokim, Veriva, Rivim Nigoy Lo Chasid, Meish Mirma Ba'afela Tefaleteni. Loosely translated, the Pasuk means, Save me. Save me from marrying somebody who's corrupt, who is dangerous, who is unworthy. And I understood that the Bore Olam, he was talking to me through your advice. Our Chachamim asked, why is it that the Bore Olam, he gave these powers of persuasion, <clears throat> these seductive powers to the woman? We know that Shimshon HaGibor, he was a Navi Elohim, he was a prophet. His physical and spiritual strength were legendary. Single-handedly, he took up on thousands upon thousands of Pelishtim soldiers. He was unstoppable. Yet he crumbled before his wife. It was his wife who managed to get the secret out of him, the secret of his strength. From where did he draw his physical and spiritual powers? It was his wife that brought his physical and spiritual death. The Gemara and Berachot goes as far to say that the seductive powers of a woman are so powerful that a man may not even hear a woman sing. Other than his wife, a man may not hear kol isha, the voice of a woman in song. Why is it? Why is it that the Bore Olam gave them this power? And our Chachamim answer, because it is this power, it is this koach that can build Klal Yisrael. It is this koach that can build a man or destroy a man. The Midrash says, when Moshe Rabbeinu came to build the Kiyov, the wash basin in the Mishkan, the woman came to offer their mirrors, their brass mirrors, in order to be melted down to build the Kiyor. Moshe Rabbeinu was very hesitant to accept such a donation. How could he accept, so to speak, a tool of the Yetzer Hara? How could, he, how could he accept something that the women used to beautify themselves for the Mishkan? And just as he was about to refuse the woman, the Bore Olam came to him. 
He says, it's these donations that I want. This is the most precious donation that anyone can bring. Dafka, these mirrors I want you to build the kiyor with. When B'nai Israel were enslaved in the desert, as we know, the men were enslaved under the torturous labor of the Egyptians. When they came home at night, they came home more dead than alive. They were unable to perform their duties as husbands. There was a very real danger that Cloud Israel would become extinct. So what did the women do? They went to these very mirrors. They beautified themselves. They made themselves attractive to their husbands in order to ensure that Cloud Israel would continue. It is this donation that the Borei Olam is looking for. When they use their kohot for this, this is what the Borei Olam wants in the Bet HaMikdash. The Midrash continues to explain, because of their great devotion, that Kla Yisrael should continue, even under the Egyptian slavery, even under the Gezerah of Paro, that the children, that the male boy should be thrown in the Nile, the Borei Olam performed an incredible chain of miracles. When the woman would come to term, they would go out to the fields to hide from the Egyptians and they would give birth. The Borei Olam, he sent Malachim to clean the babies, to beautify the babies, to nurse the babies. And when the Egyptians caught on that the children were hiding in the fields, the Egyptians sent their soldiers to kill them. And then the Borei Olam caused the ground to open up and swallow these children. And he watched over them until they were old enough to return to their families. It was all bishut of the devotion of the women. The way they made themselves attractive was bishut that, that the Borei Olam made this incredible chain of miracles to save Klal Yisrael. Once Rabbi Yochanan, he was bathing in the Yabden, in the Jordan River. And as he was bathing, the head of the bandits, the mafia boss, jumped in. Rish Lakish. When Rabbi Yohanan saw the incredible power that he managed to jump from a bank on top into the river, he told him, you have to use your kochot for Torah. You have to use your incredible strength to study Torah. Let's cut a deal. Abandon your ways and study Torah, and I'll give you my sister. Rabbi Yohanan was known as an exceptionally handsome individual. He told Rish Lakish, if you think I'm beautiful, then you've seen nothing yet. You have to see my sister. Abandon your way, study Torah, and I'll give you my sister in marriage. The obvious question is, how could Rabbi Yohanan take such a chance? How could he give over his sister to Rish Lakish? The head criminal, the most wanted person. He was on the FBI's most wanted list. How could he take the word of Rish Lakish that he would abandon his ways and give him his sister? So the Chachamim answer, because Rabbi Yohanan understood that the only influence in the world, the only power in the world that could change the most wanted person in the world is the power, the influence of a woman. He knew with the right woman, Rish Lakish could change. And indeed, Rish Lakish went on to become Migedole Ha'amoraim, from the greatest Tamidei Chachamim of his time. We all know, but we also, we never get tired of hearing about the Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was an uncultured, boorish, 40-year-old ignoramus. He was a 40-year-old shepherd. And along came Rahel, Rahel, the daughter of Kalba Savua. She was the princess of Klal Israel, from the wealthiest aristocratic families in her time. She married him, and she transformed him from Akiva to Rabbi Akiva. She transformed him to the rabbi, to the teacher of Rabbi Meir Balanes and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The Gemara says that one time Moshe Rabbeinu went up to heaven and he saw the Borei Olam, he was affixing crowns to the letters. And he asked the Borei Olam, what are you doing? 
What's the purpose of these crowns? And the Borei Olam said to him, one day there's going to be a Talmud Chacham who's going to be Doresh. He's going to learn Tile Tilim Shel Halachot. Mounds upon mounds of Halachot from these crowns. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, you have to show me him. You have to show me who this Talmud Chacham is going to be. So the Borei Olam fast forwarded time and he put Moshe Rabbeinu into the Shi'ur of Rabbi Akiva. And as Moshe Rabbeinu was sitting, Moshe Rabbeinu who brought the Torah from Shamayim to Klal Israel, Moshe Rabbeinu was the student of the Borei Olam, he didn't understand the Shi'ur of Rabbi Akiva. He didn't understand what Rabbi Akiva was saying. After the Shi'ur, Moshe Rabbeinu turned to the Borei Olam. He said, if you have a Talmud Chacham like this, why did you give the Torah through me? Give the Torah to Klal Yisrael through him. He's clearly greater than me. And the Borei Olam said to him, silence. Gezerah himi lefanai. I have decreed it shall be. Rachel took Rabbi Akiva, a 40-year-old ignoramus shepherd, and she transformed him into somebody greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. This is the influence, this is the koach that a woman has. We are all familiar with the rebellion of Korach Ba'adato. With the encouragement of his wife, Korach went up against Moshe Rabbeinu. The Midrash says, the Midrash was as far to say, if it wouldn't have been for the wife of Korach, Korach would have never had the audacity to stand up to challenge Moshe Rabbeinu. He drew his strength from his wife. It was his wife who pushed him to challenge Moshe Rabbeinu. What was the end of Korach? The ground opened up and swallowed Korach and all his followers. What people don't know is that there's a sequel to this story. The Gemara in Sanhedrin writes that one time, Rabbi Bar Bar Khana, he was walking through the desert with an Arab merchant. And the Arab says to him, you want to know where the ground swallowed up Korach? Rabbi Bar Bar Khana says, sure. He says, follow me. They came to a place in the desert where there was two cracks and there was smoke rising from the cracks. The Arab took a spear he wetted some wool, some cotton, he put it on the spear, and he inserted it into the ground. He then removed the spear, and the wet wool was burnt to a crisp. Rabbi Barbat Hana, he put his ear, he bent over, he put his ear to the ground, and he hears Korach Ba'adato screaming, Moshe Emet, Vitorato Emet, Moshe is truthful, and his Torah is truthful. A woman can push a man into a fiery pit as the wife of Korach did, or a woman can raise a man to be greater than Moshe Rabbeinu as the wife of Rabbi Akiva did. It's all in the Korach, it's all in the influence of a man. The Gemara tells a story. In the time of Kimchis, the Chachamim, they came to Kimchis. She had seven sons who became Kohanim Gedolim. And they asked her, they said, Bishchut ma, in what merit did you deserve that seven children, seven sons should become Kohanim Gedolim? And she told them that the walls of my house never saw my hair uncovered. Not only did she cover her head, but the walls of her house never saw her, her hair uncovered. I've heard this Gemara many times, and just yesterday, I saw a very interesting question. One of our Chachamim asked, why does the Chachamim go to Kimchis? If she had seven children that became Kohanim Gedolim, why did they assume it was Bishchut her? Maybe it was Bishchut the husband. Why didn't they go ask the husband, in what merit did you deserve seven Kohanim Gedolim? Why did they instinctively go to the wife, to the woman, and ask her? They assumed it was her merit that allowed them to have seven Kohanim Gedolim. And the answer 
is simple. The Chachamim knew the secret to the Jewish nation, the secret to the Jewish people, it's in the wife, it's in the mother. When you see a great personality, it's thanks to the mother. The mother is like the field from where the children grow. The quality of the crop depends more on the field than it does on the seed. And therefore they knew that the zechut of these children becoming Kohanim Gedolim, it lay with the mother. So they went and they asked the mother instead of asking the father. It's interesting to note that when the Borei Olam gave the Torah to Klal Yisrael, he first went to the women and then he went to the men. What does the Pasuk say? The Pasuk says, Ko tomav lebet Yaakov betaged. So shall you tell the house of Yaakov. Who's the house of Yaakov? It's the women. And then afterwards, And then you will speak it to the men. Whose responsibility? Whose chiyuv? Whose obligation is it to study Torah? It's the men. Why does the pastor says, Ko tomav lebet Yaakov? The Borei Olam tells Moshe Rabbeinu, first go to the woman, then go to the man. Well, who studies the Torah? Who do we send to the Talmud Torah, to the Yeshiva, to the Bet Midrash, to the Kolel? Why is he going to the woman? Why not go to the man? Because ultimately, it's the woman who guard. It's the woman who ensure that the men will learn. It's the woman who protect the families. It's the woman who influence the husband and the children. First go to the woman. Go to the ones who are going to be who have the influence. Well, as they say in Yiddish, the protectia. And then you go to the men. Because it's dependent on the women. Rabbanit Kanievsky, she was simply known as the Rabbanit. When you said the Rabbanit in Eretz Yisrael, you knew you were referring to Rabbanit Kanievsky. Perhaps the greatest testimony to her greatness is that in these three, four weeks since she has passed away, directors of institutions, organizations, schools, and seminary have descended in droves down to Rabbanit Kanievsky. Why are they all coming? Why are these directors and these principals and these heads of all these organizations come to Rabbi Kanievsky? Because they've all decided, each one on his own, to rename their institution in her name. They've all come to her husband, Rabbi Kanievsky, to get her brach, his bracha, to rename their institution in her name because of her incredible influence. And it's not one, it's not two. They're coming in droves. Organizations and institutions across Eretz Israel are renaming themselves in her name because of her incredible influence. I'm going to finish. They say, Gadol Sadikim Bemitatan, Sadikim are greater in their death than when they are alive. I was in New York for the past five days. Rabbi Levar called me about a day before I went. He says, Bezrat Hashem, we're making this evening. We're going to have a few speakers. So I was there. I was on Coney Island. And I walked into a Judaica store. I said, excuse me, Mrs. I said, do you have any old newspapers? The Hamodia, the Yated, any old magazines from three, four weeks ago? I need stories about the Rabbanit, about the Rebetzin. And this lady on Coney Island, she tells me, I'm going to tell you a story. I said, great. She had my attention. She tells me that her daughter went for a bracha by Shavuot. She needed a certain Yeshua, a certain salvation. She didn't want to tell me what it was, but her daughter went for a bracha to Rabbanit Kanievsky in a certain area. But of Hashem, the Rabbanit was very warm. She gave her a bracha and she left. She told me two days after the Rabbani passed away, her daughter got the Yeshua. Her daughter got the salvation. Gadol tzadikim ve'mitatan. The tzadikim, 
The righteous ones are greater in their death than when they are there alive. Bezrat Hashem, the memory of the Tzadeket should be a schut for Klal Yisrael. May she continue to protect and to influence Klal Yisrael from up high. Good night. Amen. <laughs>